So uh, the producer Arthur Freed and director Vincent Minnelli bumped into Irving Berlin in the MGM canteen. They told him of their plans for the movie American in Paris and their idea to end it with a 17-minute ballet. And Irving Berlin told them he hoped they knew what they were doing. Now, the writers of Singing in the Rain, uh, Betty Comden and Adolph Green, we'll hear a little bit about Adolph Green later, park that name, uh, they thought the picture was perfect as it was. The money men at MGM did not want the ballet. And Freed felt that without the ballet, the movie was just cute. But with the ballet, it could be something great. And it was a British film that gave them hope. And that film was The Red Shoes, which had come out in 1948. And that featured a 17-minute ballet. And Arthur Freed was determined to outdo Powell and Pressburger, which is not an easy thing to try and pull off. When the filming was complete, Minnelli said, we knew we had something great. And he had a little help from chicken pox. Now, Freed had grown up Arthur Freed had grown up with George Gershwin, uh, the composer, and his lyricist brother, Ira. And George had written the jazz-influenced piece, American in Paris, in 1928. George had died in 1937 at the age of just 38. And in 1945, he was the subject of a biopic. Now, the problem with musical biopics is that they tell you how songs were written. They don't engage with the emotions of the songs. And so Arthur Freed wanted to honour the spirit of the music of his late friend. Any picture which attempted to do so would somehow need to reflect both George's popular and orchestral works. Now one night, Freed was losing pool to Ira Gershwin, and he asked Ira whether he could use the orchestral piece in American in Paris to go into a film. And Ira said, that's fine, as long as you use all Gershwin music throughout, which was secretly what Freed was hoping he would say. Now, Gene Kelly was cast as the lead due to his ballet prowess. I'm not sure Fred Astaire would have been able to pull this one off. Um, and Kelly had pitched the idea of an American GI who wanted to be a painter and had stayed on in Paris after World War II. Now, this theme dove dovetailed really nicely with the fact that George Gershwin had studied art in Paris himself. As a scriptwriter, Freed brought in Alan J. Lerner. Now, Alan J. Lerner is best known as the scriptwriter and lyricist for My Fair Lady, Gigi and Camelot. And although he didn't get to write the lyrics of An American in Paris, he was very keen to do the project. So he wrote the first 40 pages and then came to a creative full stop. And his job was to weave the songs into a believable storyline that somehow fleshed out Kelly's ideas. And for months, the screenplay was unfinished until the night before his wedding, Lerner pulled an all-nighter and finished it. Now, I say the night before his wedding, it'd be more appropriate to say the night before one of his many weddings. Now, Oscar Levant was a pianist and composer who knew George Gershwin, and he was cast early on to play a part that was essentially himself. Kelly and Lerner wanted to cast Maurice Chevalier for the role of the music hall entertainer. Chevalier was unavailable. Depending on what source you read, he may have turned the part down. And Kelly thought that he turned the part down because his character lost the girl. This turned out to be a blessing in disguise because two weeks after he was unavailable, a splash came out which alleged that Chevalier had entertained Nazi soldiers during World War II. It was Lerner who discovered George Gatory on Broadway. Uh, Gatory was far too young for the part uh, in which he was cast, which was the part that Chevalier was due to play. Um, so they grade him up, uh, not terribly convincingly uh, to my mind. Freed wanted to cast a genuine French actor in the role of Lise. And there are two stories regarding the casting of Leslie Caron. Either Freed saw her photo on the front of Parry Match and made her a star, or Jean Kelly remembered her from a ballet he'd seen two years previously. Either way, the 38-year-old Jean Kelly went to France to screen test the 17-year-old Leslie Caron. 
Terran. Mm -hmm. Now, Freed didn't want to shoot in Paris, and Kelly was always upset with that decision. He never thought that the sets were fully like France. Um, and Manelli had to scout around for French actors in Southern California to fill out the smaller parts and all the extras. During rehearsals, Caron proved to be pretty shy and she had suffered from malnutrition during World War II and she was not used to Kelly's 18 hour days. Caron was learning to perform in a new medium, in a new language. So shooting for the movie began on the 1st of August, 1950. Levant had been told there was no place in the film for his style of concert performance. And this sent him into a bit of a depression. Uh, Levant himself came up with the idea of the ego fantasy performance, whereby he would appear playing Gershwin's concerto in F on the piano and all the other instruments in the orchestra. Uh, Adolf Green mentioned him earlier, one of the writers of Singing in the Rain. Little note here, he's the body double for the conductor in this sequence. Um, so uh, this sequence was so carefully planned, it's quite amazing when you see it, that it only took one day to shoot. It's quite an amazing uh, thing to have pulled off in one day. The only traditional production number you'll see, so by that we mean most of the songs come out of character, place, uh, they, they are part of the narrative, but a production number, the narrative stops and they just perform a song. There's one of these in the whole movie, and that's I'll Build a Stairway to Paradise. And this was Minelli's tribute to the Folie Bergère. It features steps that were electrically wired to light up in time with George Gatory's movement. And in, and, and in Minelli's words, as much nudity as the code would allow. Now, towards the end of the film, there's a ball which is held. And Minelli designed this in black and white, so it would be in contrast to the colour that they use in the ballet sequence. Now, the crew all pitched in above and beyond the call of duty. They had bought all the black and white confetti there was in Southern California. So the head prop man stayed up all night punching little holes out of black and white cardboard. Manelli was finding it hard to carve out the time to conceive of what the ballet was actually going to be about. When Fortune struck Nina Foch, who was playing the heiress, down with chicken pox. Now, Foch couldn't be filmed around, so they had to stop production for three days. And Kelly and Manelli went into a room together, and three days later, they had the libretto for the ballet. Now, with most of the film in the can, the production stopped on the 1st of November, whilst Kelly worked out the choreography for six weeks for the ballet, and the sets were built. As you do, in the meantime, Minelli shot another movie, mm. the sequel to Father of the Bride. And he was so impressed with the cameraman on that movie that he brought that cameraman back to work on just the ballet. And this was the first, it was called Alton, and it was the first colour movie he'd ever done. Now, Manelli's sets in the ballet, let's talk about the ballet, right? It's the, it's the elephant in the room. People love it or they hate it. Now, the sets in the ballet are stylized, and they imagine how the backgrounds would look if they had been painted by certain French Impressionist painters. So we have Manet, Van Gogh, Toulouse-Lautrec. And the brush strokes and the textures typical of those artists are visible in the scenery. It took 30 painters six weeks to make the sets, and in each of the six sections of the ballet, Kelly endeavoured to translate the emotion of the painting into his choreography. Now, early in the film, you'll see Leslie Caron's character, Lise, is associated with a red rose. She kind of drops it when she's being painted. And the ballet uses that red rose as a symbol of her. Kelly's mind in the ballet begins empty. He sketches and emotions tumble in his mind. Life without lease is like Paris without colour. And then colour drenches the scene, and everywhere is carnival. The American mingles with the crowd, but he's ignored. He sees Louise, but he loses her. He goes to a lifeless flower market, and an illusion of Lise appears, but he can't touch her. 
and then hope. He finds some Americans. He has a reason to live and he finds his own rhythms. There's brightness and he sees Lees in her own environment. They dance carefree with Deli Kelly dancing tap, symbolising America, whilst Lees is on point, symbolising Europe. He dreams of reciprocated love and now he feels part of Paris. But at the end of the ballet, he's back to nothingness and he's all alone. So the shooting ended on the 2nd of January. It's lasted all the way from August to the 2nd of January. That's a hard slog. And the final cost was $2,700,000, of which the ballet cost half a million dollars and used 210 costumes. The reviews were really positive. So Bosley Crowther, for example, of the New York Times, wrote that it was a grandly pictorial ballet which placed a mark of distinction on this lush technicolour escapade. Now, An American in Paris was planned as crowd-pleasing entertainment, but because of the decisions made by a superlative team, this film has become a classic. It was a financial success and won seven Oscars. Interestingly, it was only the second movie in colour to win uh, Best Movie at the Oscars. The other was, anyone know? Gone with the Wind. Um, all the rest have been black and white up to them. Uh, and it won for Best Screenplay as well. Now, Kelly had hoped to win for Best Actor. But on the evening of the Oscars performance, he wasn't even mentioned in association with the movie. He wasn't there, by the way. He was off filming another film. He didn't have an Oscar, but on the plus side, MGM did give him a bonus of $12,500. So it's not all bad news. So I'm going to leave you with something to look out for. And this is absolutely brilliant. Try, if you can remember this, by the time we get there in the movie, it's going to be brilliant. Um, as they were about to shoot the ballet, Minnelli realised that the transition from realistic story to fantasy needed a little something in the script. And he called Lerner, who was off the job now in New York, <coughs> probably writing My Fair Lady or some such. And he said, look, can you write me a speech that sums up a two hour movie? And it explains the emotions that Kelly's character is feeling. And can you somehow translate the love story to a bunch of French painters? And you have to introduce a ballet. Oh, and it can't be too long and we're filming tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so Lerner had a little think, he phoned through his suggestion, Manelli loved it, and years later, Lerner said, you know what, I don't actually understand what that speech is all about. Mm. So look out for it. And now from this foggy day in London town, let's see an American in Paris. Mm.